My friend Jeff and I used to love trying to scare each other with the darkest, most twisted movies we could find. Every Friday night, he would come to my apartment with takeout pizza, and we would eat it all while feeding our minds nightmare fodder. We took turns choosing movies, and as our tolerances for terror built, we each began to choose movies more grotesque than they were good. I felt particularly filthy after Jeff showed me a film called Cannibal Holocaust, during which I frequently reminded myself I was watching actors and prayed that was true. I mean, we streamed it to my smart TV with freaking Peacock, so it must have been ethically produced, right? After I turned my TV off, Jeff said, Well, that was way worse than I remember. The most horrifying part is that people actually made this, I replied. After a deep study of the empty pizza boxes, Jeff said, Still kind of a good movie, though, right? Like, in a super weird way? I did not share this sentiment and suggested maybe we could rewrite the rules of our little game. Instead of trying to disturb one another, since I didn't think we could realistically go much further than we just had, I suggested we find popular or classic movies that the other had not yet seen to fill in the gaps in one another's mental libraries. I could tell Jeff thought I was being a wimp, but he agreed to the idea as long as I admitted he had won our original contest. I conceded. I was given first pick for the next week and chose the James Wan classic, Dead Silence, which is about the spirit of a terrifying old lady possessing a ventriloquist dummy. Fun, right? Oh, sweet. James Wan did Saw, right? Jeff asked as he pulled away a slice of sausage and mushroom. I said, yeah, but this is the one that sort of established the types of visuals he would lean into later in his career, you know, with stuff like The Conjuring and Insidious. Chewing, Jeff said. Oh, dope. I love both of those. Dead Silence is, was, one of my personal favorites, and very familiar to me. So I was surprised when I noticed something fairly obvious that I had not noticed before. During one of the not-so-scary plot-laying scenes, a disembodied shadow moved across a blank wall in the background behind Ryan Quanton. It looked like the shape of a small man as it darted out of frame. I laughed and told Jeff some crew member must have run in front of the lights by accident and the editors didn't notice. But Jeff said he hadn't noticed the shadow. I didn't think much of it since I had probably seen the movie half a dozen times and had not noticed the mistake either until then. Things got a little weirder during a later scene that depicted a flashback of the ventriloquist still living and performing with the dummy on stage. There was plenty of creepy stuff happening in the foreground, but I noticed someone peek out from behind the red stage curtain behind the old woman. The lens being slightly out of focus in that part of the frame distorted his face. The camera switched to another angle for almost a minute, and everything was normal. But when the camera switched back, I saw him clearly. A man with gray skin, disfigured by burns and scars, was peering out from behind the curtain, staring directly into the camera. None of the characters paid him any mind, and his presence seemed totally disconnected from the rest of the movie. Like I said, I knew Dead Silence well, and I did not recall the strange figure from any later scenes which his appearance could be meant to foreshadow. He stared with lidless white eyes that were almost too close together. His nose, if he had ever had one, appeared missing. His mouth somehow scared me the most, though. It was just a lipless slit that cut from cheek to cheek, forming a permanent grin. The little man rubbed his scabbed hands together and stepped fully out from behind the curtain. He was naked, but his body was essentially a featureless husk. Crusty burns covered him from the neck down. Hey, do you see... I started to ask Jeff when an intentionally scary moment occurred on screen. Jeff jumped a little and said, Ethan, I gotta give it to you. This is a good one. Yeah, but hang on, I said. Did you notice that burned-up guy in the background? Jeff looked at me. 
No, is he important? Should we go back? I said, that's the weird part. I don't remember ever seeing him before. We rewound a couple of minutes so I could show Jeff what I'd seen, but I could not find any appearance of the grinning man. I swear he was standing right there, I said, pointing to a paused frame. He was all charred, like his whole body caught on fire. Stop it, dude, you don't have to try to spook me. This movie's scary enough, Jeff said. I spent the rest of the movie apprehensively watching for the charred man to whom my brain assigned the name Grin. I hated the name, but once it popped into my head, I could not forget it. The next time I saw him was during a dark scene with very little light coming from the screen. I noticed a faint shadow moving on my apartment floor just beneath the TV. It started as nothing more than an oblong lump, sort of quivering like a nervous slug. But in an instant, it turned like the hand of a clock. At the end of the long shadow emerged an actual hand. It drooped like a wilted spider until the shadow arm reached the six o'clock position. There, the hand curled up before pointing one crooked finger directly at me. I looked up at the screen. It illuminated the faintest outline of a scabbed and boiled arm protruding from its center. Jeff and I both jumped at the same time, and I think I let out a yelp. Jeff laughed. Something that happened in the movie had startled him, apparently, not the reaching arm. In the flash of light which accompanied the big scare, the arm vanished. When I didn't laugh along with him, Jeff asked, What's up with you, man? I thought you'd seen this one before. Is it really getting you this good? I lied and told him I'd forgotten how the movie ended, that I had not seen it in a while. I didn't want him thinking I was crazy. We finished the last few minutes of the movie and ended the night as we always did, leaning on the rail of my balcony and talking about life. Our conversation distracted me enough to momentarily forget what had happened, but when Jeff said he should get going, I realized I did not want to be alone. I offered Jeff a beer, knowing if he drank, he would stay longer. No, man, if I have one, I'll want two, and if I have two, I'll have to wait like an hour to drive, and I really need to be fresh tomorrow. I'm driving home to see my family, so... It's all good, man. No worries, I replied, very worried. After Jeff left, I decided to just lock myself in my room and go to sleep. It seemed more productive than sitting up all night interrogating every bump, creak, or flush I heard in the building. I unplugged the TV from the wall before going to bed. Don't ask me why. It just made me feel a little safer. I left the TV unplugged all week. A shocking move for me back then. Besides my classwork and my part-time job at a body shop detailing cars, I didn't have much going on. Ordinarily, I would have watched one or two movies every night that week, unless I found a good series to binge. To pass the time, I went to the campus library and checked out The Exorcist by William Peter Blatty and Rosemary's Baby by Ira Levin. I hadn't read a book for fun since the summer vacation before ninth grade, so I wanted to begin in familiar territory. I only turned the TV back on when Jeff came over the next Friday night for our weekly viewing. Jeff chose 30 Days of Night, a vampire film set in an isolated town in Alaska. I had always heard about it, but never watched it for some reason. When it started, I felt nervous and wondered if and when my friend Grin would appear. But the movie quickly drew me in. After a short while, I was too invested in the plot to think about Grin. That is, until the vampires showed up. Every time one of them appeared on the screen, my heart spiked before I realized it was not Grin. Their pale skin looked just like his, minus the burns. He eventually appeared next to a building in the background, his lipless smile and vacant eyes as white as the snow surrounding him. He slowly raised an arm, but just before he pointed his charred finger at me, the scene changed. 
I reached for any excuse to stop the movie. Jeff wouldn't have believed the real reason I wanted to unplug the TV again. I asked him to pause it so I could grab a bag of chips and some dip. This also provided an excuse to turn on the light in the kitchen for a couple of minutes. You're still hungry? Jeff laughed. I wasn't, but I said, Yeah, dude, I barely ate anything all day. I spent a suspicious amount of time selecting the right chips and searching my barren refrigerator for the mostly empty container of dip. I asked Jeff if he'd like a beer, but he refused again. I later learned he was worried about being an alcoholic and had quietly decided to take a break from drinking to prove to himself that he could. I didn't know that at the time, so I didn't feel bad when I helped myself to one of those beers, hoping it would help calm me down. In the kitchen, I had my back turned to the TV, so it wasn't until I turned off the light and turned around that I noticed two reaching arms traced in the TV's faint light again. In some places, their bones were exposed, flashing white in the darkness. The hands looked like they were searching for something to grab a hold of to pull the rest of the body out of the picture. As soon as I saw them, I hauled the beer bottle back and chucked it at them. The bottle went straight through them and cratered the TV screen. Along with the movie, the arms disappeared. Jeff leapt to his feet, knocking an empty pizza box off the coffee table with his knee. What the hell, man? I said, I saw, I... I could not decide what to say. The truth was so crazy, he would think I made it up. Trapped in this irony, I chose a more reasonable-sounding lie. I thought I saw a bat fly right in front of the TV. You didn't see it? I tried to sound convincing enough to make him wonder if he really had missed something. No, he emphatically replied. Oh, I said. Must have been my eyes adjusting to the dark or something. Well, crap, dude. I'm sorry. That Friday night died young. Jeff left shortly after the bottle incident. I think I made him a bit anxious, maybe afraid. I could understand if he thought I seemed unpredictable. I cannot say I would have automatically believed him had our roles been reversed. On the bright side, with the TV broken and all the lights on, I did not have to worry about my safety and could instead focus on what might be happening. I felt fine, totally normal, and I had not taken any drugs or medication that might have caused hallucinations. The idea that Jeff might be pranking me crossed my mind, but would he have continued the joke after I smashed my own TV? Probably not. I ruled that possibility out, which left one remaining as far as I could tell. Grin was real, which begged the question, what was he? The next morning I went home to see my dad. I used to go home every few weekends, so it was no great occasion. When I arrived, dad had gone out for the burgers and beer we would catch up over later that night. I should have gone into my old room and started studying for the three exams I had coming up, but after my second encounter with Grin, I found myself generally afraid of all screen-equipped devices. Thank God I still drove a 2008 Chevy Malibu with nothing more than a digital clock in it, or I might have been too anxious to make the drive. Avoiding screens in this era creates a level of boredom my generation finds as uncomfortable as it is unfamiliar. The way our parents used to pace back and forth while talking on the phone, we pace aimlessly when we aren't using one. I became engrossed in the wall of photos in Dad's hallway. Most were of the two of us with Mom, or just Mom and I. She passed away from cancer seven years ago, and Dad claims he's healed, but his love life says otherwise. He set up profiles on a couple of dating sites, but he insisted on using a profile picture that included Mom, I just want whoever I meet next to know your mom will always be part of me, he said. There were a few photos on the wall of good times with other people. One in particular showed my parents with another couple at a lake party. Technically, I was also in the picture, bulging out beneath mom's bikini top. Her skin looked stretched enough to pop from the sunlight alone. The male half of the other couple transfixed me. His face was not automatically familiar 
but it had certain qualities I recognized, the first being the placement of his eyes. They were much closer together than average, and his smile, though jovially good-natured and slightly drunken, gave me a haunting sensation akin to deja vu. Almost without thinking, almost against my own will, I covered the man's nose with the tip of my pinky. Dad came in through the garage. The sound of the doorknob turning startled me and forced me to retract my hand from the photo. However, I had seen enough to confirm my suspicion. I thought there was a chance after seeing it for most of my life, the photo lived deep enough in my memory to have affected a subliminal projection onto the mysterious figure from the movies, but I needed to find out who exactly he was before letting this possibility settle. Ethan? Dad called out. Yep, in the hallway, I returned. He found me. This is where I come to remember her too, he said, lingering on one of the most recent photos of Mom. Yeah, I agreed. Then, I actually wanted to ask you about this one. I pointed to the lake party photo. Who's this guy? Dad didn't answer for a moment as pregnant as Mom in the picture, prompting me to glance back at him. He stepped forward, putting us shoulder to shoulder, then sighed. You probably wouldn't remember him, huh? You were only two. That's not me Mom's pregnant with? I asked. No, it is, Dad answered, almost laughing as if searching for any potential humor in what I did not realize was going to be such a serious conversation. I mean, you were two when they died. See, that's my old friend Gary Vine and his wife Jenna. You might have heard me talk about Gary before. I shook my head. Huh. Well, I guess me and your mom definitely didn't talk about him around you much. So why is his picture on the wall? I asked. Because this is the last good memory I have with Gary, Dad answered. When you were born, something very strange happened to him. Because we'd always gone through sort of the same stages of life together, Gary and I, he felt left behind when you were born. He started putting all this pressure on Jenna to have a kid, but I don't think she wanted to. At least not yet. Sounds tense. Tense? Ha. You really don't remember Gary. Look, we had a lot of fun together, but Gary is to this day the most intense guy I've ever known. When I say he put pressure on his wife, Dad trailed off, not wanting to speak something terrible from the past into the present. Let's just say they grew very unhappy. By your first birthday, we'd expected them to divorce, but they stayed together all the way until your second. You remember the Thomas the Train party? I think I remembered the photos better than the party itself, but I nodded. That was the last time we saw Gary and Jenna. By then, it was pretty clear they either couldn't get pregnant or Jenna was doing something to prevent it. According to Gary, they'd been consistently trying for over a year at that point with no luck. Gary and I had definitely started to drift apart by then, somewhat intentionally on my part. I didn't like being around him anymore, always so negative and honestly, a bit scary. Your mom worried for Jenna, which is the only reason I didn't cut Gary out completely. Plus, you know, we'd made other friends who had kids about your age and a lot of our free time started going to them. As far as I know, Gary made no effort to find new friends, and I don't think he let Jenna mingle much either. But when did he die, and how? It felt rude to ask so directly, but I got the sense Dad could delay talking about his friend's death for as long as I would allow it. Oh, shortly after that Thomas party, Dad answered. Jenna worked at the headquarters for a burgeoning tech company. There were a bunch back then before they all got bought up and Gary showed up at her office with a knife one day. Jeez, I mumbled. We found out later that Jenna had filed for divorce. Her lawyer served Gary the papers just minutes before he showed up at her office. They burned up in his hands. Burned up? I asked. Dad sucked his teeth and looked downward. Jenna's workplace had a big server room. I guess she ran in there to hide while a coworker called the cops, but Gary chased her in. 
that's where he where he stabbed her to death and after that I guess he freaked out and barricaded himself in the server room when the cops showed up he freaked out even more there were some coolant containers in the room from a maintenance guy who was in the middle of a repair job and stepped out for lunch Gary might be in prison instead of dead if not for that one small detail he dumped two bottles of coolant on himself then used his lighter to set himself on fire they tried to save him but Gary was basically dead by the time they busted in that fire just about burned his entire nose off from what I heard sorry dad I didn't mean to bring up something so my voice became trapped as I realized what he said about Gary's nose it's all right now you know dad chortled sort of ironically and scratched his head as if trying to itch away the thought that had manifested there you want to know the last thing he said to me it still makes me shudder a bit to this day sure I said believing it impossible to give any other answer at your second birthday party Gary cornered me and told me for the 17th time about the problems he and Jenna were having getting pregnant at the end he sort of trailed off and I caught him staring at you you were using your finger to clean all the leftover frosting off your cake he said something along the lines of I don't know how you got so lucky to have a boy like that when you weren't even trying sometimes I think about just taking him you know oh my god what'd you say to that I asked dad's eyebrows went high I told him in no uncertain terms that was a very creepy and disturbing thing to say and told Jenna about it poor Jenna I think if I'd had a little foresight I could have helped her I don't grieve much for Gary he dug his own grave and put himself in it but I do feel awful about Jenna I said so let me get this straight Gary killed his wife and himself in the server room yeah that's right dad replied interesting I said without thinking how so asked dad recovering I said oh I meant interesting isn't the right word I know what you mean dad said punching my shoulder lightly I thought no you definitely do not fortunately for me dad's not much of a TV or movie guy if anything he would select something from his DVD collection to put on the old plasma screen from when I was in high school disregarding the crappy Wi-Fi for his outdated laptop dad's house is sort of an oasis from the internet it feels like 2007 there you only connect if and when you want to since I basically put my phone under my pillow and left it there for the duration of my visit I managed to stay away from any signals Gary slash grin might hitchhike on to find me my running theory about how Gary got to me was that his spirit became trapped in one of the servers where he died he must have utilized its connection to the World Wide Web to go exploring to find me if he died when I was two his trip was almost 20 years long but why come looking for me all I can think of is he either thinks I'm still a baby or Gary slash grin is so jealous and so angry he could not have a child of his own that despite my age he wishes to steal or kill me did he mean it out of vengeance or to fulfill his dream I do not believe I will ever learn the answers to these questions but to a certain extent I don't really need to anymore my smart TV the one with the broken screen still worked the cratered screen remained black whenever I turned it on but all the internal functions and the sound still operated normally I learned this while experimenting to see if I could sell it for parts a wild idea caught hold of me before I posted the TV for sale though I thought I might be able to use the TV to get rid of grin for good as a college student supposed to be studying for exams avoiding any internet enabled devices with screens was beginning to take a mental and academic toll on me so even without any assurance my plan would work I felt obligated to try it in preparation I unscrewed the back of the TV found the wires which connected the speakers and cut them I wanted it to have no potential output whatsoever 
Then I put the TV back together and back on my TV stand. Black screen, dead audio, the TV was now nothing more than a black box. On my phone, which boasted 100% battery life from being left on the charger in my room for multiple days, I opened Amazon Prime Video and rented Dead Silence for $3.79. Then, sitting straight up, attentively, with my phone in both hands, I watched what used to be one of my favorite movies for the second time in just as many weeks. I reached the scene during which I saw Grin the first time, but he did not appear. My palms dampened as I worried I made a miscalculation. I didn't know what to think if Grin did not show up in the movie. Did it mean he was gone, or smart enough to avoid my trap? Or, I wondered, did he have to travel through wires? If so, my whole plan had to be thrown out. Whatever his means, Grin did make it to my phone, though. In the same scene with the ventriloquist woman performing in front of that big red curtain Grin had once peered through, this time he appeared within the audience of children. I barely noticed him far in the back where the camera lens was blurry. He sat head and shoulders above the children on either side of him, which helped give him away. That and the lipless grin with which he smiled at me through the blur. And while the children around him giggled and whispered to one another, Grin remained perfectly still, fixated on me. I rehearsed what I did next half a dozen times before starting the movie, but as Grin moved, I nearly panicked. He climbed up onto the backs of the theater seats. Then, one by one, with his hands and feet, he began crawling on top of the laughing children's heads. None of them seemed to notice, even when he left sticky gobs of charred skin stuck in their hair. He crawled nearer and nearer, looking up every second row to flash me that namesake grin. My quivering thumbs almost let me down. Almost. With one of them, I managed to tap the settings gear in the corner of the screen. Recalling from practice rounds, I found the airplay icon, tapped it, and waited two seconds before my broken TV appeared on the list of devices I could cast the movie to. As soon as it became available, I tapped it. The menu disappeared, replaced by a spinning wheel made of little gray lines. For a moment, nothing changed. Grin was close. He was perched on top of four children's heads about three rows from the camera. The scene switched to another angle. I stood up and bounced on my heels, unable to contain my anxiety. The scene returned to the audience camera, and Grin looked close enough to reach through the screen and grab me. I dropped my phone and fell back on the couch. Just as my phone hit the floor, the little wheel stopped turning, and the AirPlay logo appeared against a black background. Up in the corner, the screen read, now playing on Ethan's TV. That was all the confirmation I needed. I jumped off the couch, bounding toward the TV with one giant leap. As I'd practiced half a dozen times, I reached behind the TV stand and yanked the power cord out of the wall. A slight hum from the TV died next to my ear. I never would have noticed it before it was absent. I carried the TV out to my balcony, where Jeff and I had shared so many conversations after staring at it and chucked it into one of the dumpsters in the lot below. The TV landed with a shattering crunch. The screen broke off completely, exposing its innards. And somewhere amongst those wires and circuit boards, I knew Grin was trapped. I wondered if he was frantically searching for a way out of his disconnected new home, or if when I pulled the power cord, he died with the TV. Either way, he's gone. I managed to return to a normal existence of grinding away at schoolwork and picked up more hours at the body shop. I still managed to take a weekly break every Friday night with Jeff, too. 
I bought a new TV, and no creepy burned men made their way into our movies. We expanded our movie regimen into sci-fi and comedy for a while, but eventually did make our way back to horror. I just needed some distance from the real horror I'd experienced. Thankfully, it did not take as long as I expected. You made it out. Congratulations. If you enjoyed the story, please rate, like, review, or subscribe. For ad-free episodes and bonus Into the Woods episodes, become a patron with the link in the description. You can also support the show by buying merch. That link is also in the description below. To stay up to date, follow me on Instagram at The Warning Woods. If you feel ready, meet me here next week for another journey into the Warning Woods. Thank you for listening.